let's get started on chapter 6 IP addressing and whereas in chapter 5 we did an introduction to TCP IP in this chapter we are going to look at TCP IP in greater depth we will look at IP addressing and rules in assigning IP addresses then we will look at binary math at subnetting at NAT the network address translation and at IPv6 let's start out with IP addressing our job as technicians is to make sure that all computers are assigned IP addresses and no two computers have the same IP address we have to ensure that each computer has an IP address a subnet mask a default gateway and a DNS server if we had a single network the first computer might have an IP address of 10.0.0.1 and the next one 10.0.0.2 and the next one 10.0.0.3 if we added a second network and connected the two networks together with a router what IP addresses would we assign to these computers over here what IP address would we assign to this computer would we assign it 10.0.0.4 well it seems to me if this was 10.0.0.3 couldn't we make the next one 10.0.0.4 and the answer is no because we can't have two networks with the same network ID none of these computers here on the right can begin with a 10 they have to begin with a number which is not 10 so I'll just use I will select 11 so the first workstation will be 11.0.0.1 and the second workstation will be 11.0.0.2 now let's make sure we assign an IP address to the router the router has a network interface card connected to each network so each network interface card in the router has to have an IP address so what I'm going to do is slide all these IP addresses up so the router will be 10.0.0.1 and the first workstation will be 10.0.0.2 and the second workstation will be .3 and then similarly on the other network the IP address on the router will be 11.0.0.1 and then the first workstation will be 11.0.0.2 the router doesn't have to be dot one but we usually do that by convention so IP addressing rules all hosts on the same subnet should have different host IDs but they should have the same network ID and no two networks should have the same network ID the subnet mask tells us which part of the IP address is host ID and which part of the IP address is network ID and if an octet has 255 under it, it is network ID so in this example with an IP address of 10.0.0.2 the first octet has a 255 under it indicating that this is network 10 workstation 0.0.2 now you might say what do I need the subnet mask for this is clearly network 10 workstation 2 but here's an example which is less clear is this workstation 1.1.1 1 .1 work network 1 or is it workstation 1.1 1 .1, network 1.1 1 .1, or is it network 1.1.1 1 .1 workstation 1 and the only way we would know is the subnet mask and it could be three things if it is a class A subnet mask in this example then it's workstation 1.1.1 .1 network 1 this subnet mask called a class B subnet mask indicates that this IP address is workstation 1.1 .1 and network 1.1 .1. and this subnet mask called a class C subnet mask indicates and this IP address here it is workstation dot one but network one dot one dot one so these three IP addresses are all separate IP addresses this is the 
workstation 1 on network 1.1.1 and conversely this is workstation 1.1.1 on network 1. The subnet mask tells us which part of the IP address is network ID and which part of the IP address is host ID and there are three classes of subnet mask class A, class B, class C. A class A subnet mask by default is 255.0.0.0 and there are a maximum of 16 million potential IP addresses in a class A network. How come 16 million? Because we have three octets or 24 bits with which to assign an IP address. A class B subnet mask is 255.255.0.0 and a class C subnet mask is 255.255.255.0 and a class C subnet mask there are a maximum of 254 IP addresses because we only have one octet with which to assign IP addresses class A very big network class C very small network class B somewhere in between the two. Here is an example of a class A network. Network is 10 and the workstation is 0.0.2. Here is an example of a class C network. 255.255.255.0. So it's network 192.168.1 and it's host ID 2. When we configure TCP IP, we have four key variables to configure for each host. IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, and DNS server. And we can configure them manually or, as you know, using DHCP. To test TCP, we can use the IP config command, which displays the IP address, or the ping command, which tests connectivity between computers. Let's look at troubleshooting using ping, how we can use a process of elimination to determine where the problem is located. Here's the situation. The user says he can't log in to server one. So we have to figure out, is it the workstation, is it the router, is it server one, or is it something in between? So what we do is we go to that workstation and the first thing we do is we see if we can ping ourselves while standing at that workstation. And to ping yourself, you type ping 127.0.0.1. That's called the local loopback or self-test. And if you can't even ping yourself, well, then there's something wrong with TCP IP on this individual workstation. Now, if you can ping yourself, the next thing to do is to try to ping your nearest neighbor. If you uh, cannot ping your nearest neighbor, then that implies you don't even have a connection to the network. If you can ping your nearest neighbor, then that means you do have a connection to the network. Then the next thing to do would be to, to ping the near side of the router. If you cannot ping the near side of the router, then that implies that either the cable has fallen out of the router or the router is not turned on. If you can ping the near side of the router, then you know the cable is plugged into the router and the router is turned on. Then the next thing to do is to ping the far side of the router. <clears throat> if you can ping the near side of the router, but you can't ping the far side of the router, then that implies that the router is misconfigured. It is not pushing the packets through. If you can ping the far side of the router, then you know the router is pushing the packets through. Then the next thing to do is to try to ping some other computer on the remote network. If you cannot ping a computer on the remote network, then that implies that the cable fell out of the router. If you can ping a computer on the remote network, then that means the cable is plugged into the router. And then the last thing to do is to try to ping the server that the user is trying to access. If you can ping another computer on the remote network, but you cannot ping the server that the user is trying to get to, then that implies that either that server is just not turned on, or the cable fell out of that computer, or it's got a bad network interface card, or there is something misconfigured with TCP IP. But if you can ping that server, well then that means there's nothing wrong with TCP IP, there's nothing wrong with the cards, or the cabling or the router, 
most likely it's a higher layer problem such as the user forgot his password or forgot his username. Troubleshooting ping allows us to employ a systematic process of elimination. TCP IP addressing guidelines. As you know, all hosts on the same network should have different host IDs, the same network ID, and the same subnet mask. And no two networks should have the same network ID. Here's some other TCP IP addressing rules. The network ID should not be all zeros, and the host ID should not be all zeros. The network ID should not be all 255, and the host ID should not be all 255, and the, you should not assign a host ID of 127.0.0.1 because that is reserved for the local loopback, the self-test. In summary, we discussed IP configuration, and the four key variables are IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, and DNS server. We looked at assigning IP addresses to multiple networks, at troubleshooting using ping, and at IP addressing rules. And this concludes our section on IP address assignment.